Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our McRoberts Employment Group Autumn Update webinar, um, brought to you from all over Scotland, <laughs> um, with everyone uh, being at their respective desks. This is a live screen, uh, streamed webinar, so we are um, live today and we are going to be recording this as we go along and um, when we're finished it will be uploaded onto our website. So you'll also receive a recorded copy of the webinar um, at the end of today so that you've got a record of that. Now, for those I haven't met before, I'm Katie Wedderburn. I head our employment team um, at McRoberts, and I'm delighted to be joined today by all of our team, and in particular, those who are going to be presenting this morning are Kenny Scott, who's a legal director, Eleanor Mannion, who's a senior associate, and Megan Jenkins, who's a senior solicitor. We've got lots to tell you about this morning, um, and uh, lots, hopefully, for you to think about when you go away. and. Um, mull over what we talk about. The content that you're going to hear about is accurate today on the 27th of October. Now, I just uh, this is a warning, um, just that to be mindful that employment law is always changing and it's often very fact specific. So what you're going to hear today is a high level commentary of updates in recent cases. And if you have any specific queries or, or difficult issues, please do take advice on those because each case can often turn on its own particular circumstances. So I'll move to the next slide and give you an idea of what we're going to cover today. First of all, we're going to look at recent cases um, involving religion and philosophical belief and how those competing rights that can often develop can be managed. Secondly, we're going to give you an update about the duty to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace. Then um, new and uh, very topical at the moment is the question of whether menopause is a new protected characteristic under the Equality Act. And finally, we're going to discuss developments in disability discrimination in the considerations of long COVID. So lots to cover this morning. We will have time for a short Q&A at the end and you can submit your questions through the uh, question bar that you'll be able to see just on the right hand side of your screen and we'll pick those up and um, answer those as far as we can when we're finished. Um, so without further ado, I'm now going to pass you on to Megan Jenkins, who's going to tell us about the developments in case law in religion and philosophical belief. Megan. Hi, yes, thank you, Katie. This morning I will be discussing the recent case on respect of religion and philosophical belief and also how this protected characteristic potentially conflicts with other protected characteristics under the Equality Act. So as a very quick recap, as you will probably all be aware, the Equality Act 2010 is the legislation which underpins discrimination law in the UK. At the most basic level, it's unlawful for an employer to discriminate against an employee based on any of the nine protected characteristics. These characteristics are age, disability, gender, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief or sexual orientation. However, recent case law has emerged showing the conflicts between some of these rights so when two protected characteristics are at odds, which takes precedence and how do the courts balance these interests? The first case of note in this area is the recent case of four starter against Centre for Global Development. This case was quite prominent in the press, so many of you may be aware of the facts already. But to recap, the claimant in this case, a Ms Maya Forstatter, raised a discrimination claim against her former employer, the Centre for Global Development, after her contract was not renewed. Ms Forstatter had very fixed views on gender and believed that a person's sex was a scientific fact, which is not the same as gender or gender identity. In light of this, she believed that being female was not a feeling or an identity and that a trans woman is not in reality a woman. Whilst a person can identify as another sex, she believed that to ask other people to go along with this, and allowing them to change their legal sex under the Gender Recognition Act 2004 does not actually change their sex in reality. And she expressed these views through debates on social media and through a number of tweets expressing concerns over government plans to amend the Gender Recognition Act, which would allow people to declare their own gender. 
So Ms Forstarter believed that she had been directly discriminated against through the non-renewal of her contract because of her beliefs, and she stated that her beliefs were a philosophical belief protected under the Equality Act. So the test for what qualifies as a philosophical belief worthy of protection was set out in the earlier case of Nicholson and others against Granger. And briefly, this is that the belief must be genuinely held. It must be a belief, not an opinion or viewpoint based on the present state of information available. It must be a belief as to a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and behaviour. It must attain a set, certain level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion and importance. So it can't be about a trivial thing. And the very important fifth tenant of this is that it must be worthy of respect in a democratic society, not be incompatible with human dignity and not conflict with the fundamental rights of others. So whilst the Employment Tribunal at first instance did not challenge that the belief satisfied the first four limbs this test, they then held that Ms Forstarter was not entitled to ignore the rights of a transgender person and noted the enormous pain that can be inflicted by misgendering. The tribunal therefore held that her belief was incompatible with human dignity, conflicted with the fundamental rights of others, and therefore did not constitute a protected philosophical belief. So the claimant in this case then appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal and the EAT overturned the original decision, finding that her gender critical beliefs were philosophical beliefs and therefore protected from discrimination under the Equality Act. The case was then remitted back to a tribunal to determine whether she had in fact suffered discrimination due to this. So the case didn't go back and say that she had been discriminated against, it was to establish whether this was a protected characteristic and protected belief. So in the ruling by the EAT, they set out that freedom of expression is one of the essential foundations of a democratic society, which cannot exist without pluralism, tolerance and broad mindedness. They clarified that it wasn't for the court to determine the validity of a belief and that the only beliefs which wouldn't be covered would be those akin to pursuing totalitarianism or advocating Nazism. The threshold for quali a qualifying belief, therefore, is quite modest and it's only in extreme cases involving, as the tribunal said, the gravest violation of other convention rights that would mean a belief would fail to qualify pr for protection at all. So it's not enough, therefore, that the belief was offensive or shocking to some, or that it could, in some cases, lead to potential harassment of trans persons. So the judgment is quite interesting in that it affirms that although some beliefs may be offensive and insulting to some, employees should not be discriminated against for expressing such opinions. However, having said that, under law, employers are required to uphold and protect the rights of all employees and do remain potentially liable for acts of discrimination and harassment against individuals in the workplace. There is therefore a balance to be found concerning the beliefs of one employee against the impact that it could have on the dignity of another. So this takes me on just to my next case to contrast the difference between something being a qualifying, a, qual a qualified philosophical belief, but then the impact and how that is actually expressed. So this is the case of Higgs versus Farmer's School. And this was a UK employment tribunal case. And it was, so it was at first stage. So the decision on this isn't binding on any other court. However, it is an interesting decision and could indeed be um, persuasive and shows the court's attitudes to not only the, whether philosophical belief is covered, but then the impact of this. So Mrs. Higgs was a Christian who was employed in a school. She was dismissed for gross misconduct after an email complaint about Facebook posts that she had shared and commented on. And these posts appeared to express homophobic views against the LGBTQ plus community and expressed her view that gender cannot be fluid, i.e. that someone could not change their biological sex or gender. She consequently brought an employment tribunal claim for discrimination on the grounds of her belief because she was dismissed for gross misconduct because of these posts. And the Employment Tribunal found that the lack of belief in gender fluidity and the lack of a belief that an individual could change the biological sex was, was worthy of respect in a democratic society and therefore a protected belief, similar to the four starter case, although this was decided before the EAT judgment came out in that. However, 
despite this, the tribunal then held that the employee was not discriminated against or harassed because of her belief. Instead, she was dismissed because of the inflammatory language used in the Facebook posts, which went well beyond a reasonable expression of belief and could lead people to believe that she was homophobic or transphobic. So this case evidences that while a belief can be protected, a clear distinction can be drawn between the validity of that belief and the consequences of expressing this in an offensive or discriminatory manner and the impact it can have on others. So to take this point in a certain different slant and discuss the next case, I'm going to go over two cases from the European Court of Justice. So these are two German cases concerning employers who banned the wearing of Islamic headscarves at work. So in the case of IX against Wabi EV, the claimant worked in a non-denominational daycare centre which enforced a policy of political, philosophical and religious neutrality. The policy specified that the Christian cross, Jewish kippah or Islamic headscarf could not be worn. So despite this policy and despite receiving several warnings, the claimant in question wore an Islamic headscarf to work and this ultimately resulted in her suspension from work. And the ECG held that a pol the policy prohibiting employees from displaying political, philosophical and religious signs did not in this case amount to direct discrimination, provided that it applies to all equally and does not single out any one specific religion or belief. They also clarified that such a policy does not amount to indirect discrimination so long as it can be justified by the employer that there's a genuine need for it. And this case in question can be contrasted with another ECG case of MH Muller Handles GmbH against MJ. So in this case, the claimant worked as a sales assistant in a store which also adopted a policy of political and religious neutrality. The claimant then refused to remove her Islamic headscarf when at work and was suspended and told to return without, and this is the important language here, conspicuous large sized political, philosophical or religious signs. So the ECG in this case held that in specifying that the signs must not be large and conspicuous, the employer's actions did amount to indirect discrimination because that limited wording used meant the ban would predominantly affect those of certain religions or beliefs, so those which were large and conspicuous. This, different, this differs from the Wabi case, which was a blanket policy applied in a general and undifferentiated way, so it wouldn't target, however unintentionally, certain classes of workers. These cases displayed the court's tolerance of such policies, but do act as a reminder to employ employers that they must act reasonably and only enforce policies which apply equally, consistently to all workers, and in a manner that does not disproportionately affect those of a certain religion or belief. So although the UK is no longer a member of the European Union, and is therefore no longer bound by European case law, it is likely that the UK courts will be influenced by these decisions and remain in line with European precedent in these cases set. So it's an important principle to keep in mind for any kind of policies of neutrality in the workplace. The final case I just want to touch upon very briefly is the Northern Irish case of a few years ago of Lee against Asher's Baking Co Limited and others. And you may remember this case being that Mr. Lee, who's a gay man associated with the LGB, an LGBT community group, he requested a custom order of a cake with the words support gay marriage written in icing from Asher's Bakery. The bakery was owned by Christians who held a strong belief that marriage is reserved for a man and a woman, and they then subsequently cancelled this order. Asher's Bakery noted that they didn't cancel the order on the grounds of the particular customer sexual orientation but instead were unable to produce the cake due to their religious beliefs. So they opposed the message rather than the customer himself. So this case was based under Northern Irish equality legislation relating to the provision of goods and services. And in the first instance, the county court held the refusal to fulfill the order amounted to direct discrimination against the protected characteristic of sexual orientation. This was then upheld by the Northern Irish Court of Appeal noting that the bakery would not have refused to produce a cake supporting heterosexual marriage and therefore the refusal amounted to discrimination. 
The case was then heard by the Supreme Court, who overturned this decision and held that the bakery's refusal to produce a cake did not di directly discriminate against Mr. Lee. And the reason for this is that they noted that the reason for the less favourable treatment was not directly linked to the protected characteristic of Mr. Lee. So they noted specifically that because the less favourable treatment has something to do with sexual orientation of some people does not mean that the less favourable less favorable treatment is on grounds of sexual orientation. So that was a distinction between refusing to serve someone of a, protect, a certain protected group because of that characteristic and refusing to serve someone because of the message that they are asking for within the requested product. The reason I note this is because they have now, this case has now been appealed to the European Court of Human Rights and we are currently awaiting a decision on whether the appeal is admissible or not. So if the appeal is allowed, the outcome could change again. So do watch this space and we will keep you updated. So all of these cases include instances where the courts face a difficult balancing act between the protection of two different parties' protected characteristics. And although the facts of each case are very specific, a policy which is applied in equal measure and to all parties seems to be the most reasonable and justifiable means of enforcing policies of neutrality. However, striking the balance of all parties in practical terms will always be based on the specific facts and people involved. So whilst they are a useful guide, it shows that this is not an easy issue. It will not be something that's easy to solve and there probably will be further litigation based on this and each case would need to be considered on its own merits. So I'll now hand you back to Katie who will discuss the duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment. Thanks, Megan. Uh, some really interesting contrasts there in those decisions. Now, the UK has had legislation making sexual harassment unlawful um, towards employees and workers who carry out work personally in their jobs, as well as to job applicants. And that's all in the Equality Act, again, 2010. This is a theme for us today. That came from prior legislation as well. So. <clears throat> this is a familiar thing to us for a long time now. More recently, over the last few years, we've seen a lot in the media about the Me Too movement, and that really propelled um, issues of workplace harassment into the spotlight. Now, according to research carried out by CIPD in 2020, 4% of employees say that they've been sexually harassed at work over the last three years, and that younger employees were more likely to be affected. Now, sexual harassment in the context of an employment relationship is defined as being unwanted conduct of a sexual nature or that is related to gender reassignment or sex, which has the purpose or effect of violating dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. And because of the recipient's rejection or submission, rejection of or submission to the conduct, they are then less favourably treated than they would be if they hadn't done that. That is um, contained in section 26.3 of the Equality Act for any of those who would like to go and <laughs> read the specific provision. Now, a single incident can be enough to constitute harassment and there's no need for the recipient to make it clear that the conduct is unwanted for it to be caught. A very wide range of behaviours can be caught by the definition and there is helpful advice from ACAS that gives us examples such as flirting, gesturing or making sexual comments about someone's body, their clothing or appearance, asking questions about someone's sex life, telling sexually offensive jokes, making sexual comments, displaying or sharing pornographic um, or sexual images or other sexual content touching people against their will, even hugging them, and also the more obvious types of behaviour like sexual assault or rape would be covered. Now, um, there's currently no express duty to prevent harassment. So what we have is a provision describing the behaviours and saying that they would be um, harassment, but there is no duty to prevent that from occurring. Interestingly, the ACAS advice does go a bit further than that, and it does say that employers must do all they reasonably can to protect staff from sexual harassment and take the steps to prevent it from happening. 
Now, that's interesting because um, we're now looking at proposed new laws coming in. A report from 2018 from the Women and Equality Select Committee on Sexual Harassment in the Workplace actually calls on regulators to take a more proactive role. And there was then a, a consultation run by the government um, to understand whether existing legislation was operating effectively. And that ran um, in the latter half of 2019. Seems like a long time ago, but in, uh, in COVID pandemic terms, it wasn't that long ago. Um, and this is all now coming back again, having been put effectively on a back burner because of the pandemic. Now, following that consultation, the government outlined its intention to introduce a mandatory duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment. So that's a much more rigorous obligation that's going to come our way. It's also looking at scope for enforcement action by the Equality and Human Rights Commission and is supporting the EHRC in the development of a new statutory code of practice on sexual harassment. So that would supplement the Equality Act code of practice that there already is. I think, as many of you will know, employers are responsible for the actions of their employees who discriminate or harass colleagues in the course of their work. And in the Equality Act, there is a defence for employers if they can show that they have taken all reasonable steps to prevent that harassment from taking place. The government's response to the consultation suggests a similar defence is likely to be open to employers in terms of this duty to prevent harassment. Now, in its response to the consultation, the government has also confirmed that it has an intention to introduce explicit workplace protections for third party harassment. So, for example, that would mean an, a duty on an employer to prevent harassment of employees by customers or by clients or third parties coming into the workplace. That's quite a wide opening of the gates, if you can imagine, in the terms of the types of claims that people could make. Now, um, the consultation also has covered the possibility of extending protection under the Equality Act to volunteers and interns who are not currently covered. And so there's a very potentially wide scope of new law coming in with this duty to prevent the um, harassment from occurring. Now, I've mentioned um, that there's a desire to develop a statutory code of practice and a guide. And this will be really helpful, I think, to see the types of steps that employers could take to respond to harassment and to try to be able to rely on a statutory defence. The final aspect just to bear in mind is that as a result of this consultation as well, the government has recognised that a three month time limit, which is the current position for those wishing to bring sexual harassment claims, may in fact be a barrier to justice. For example, people who deal with trauma caused by sexual harassment. And this view was actually shared by about 59% of the respondents to the consultation. So on the back of that, the government is also considering extending the time limit for bringing harassment claims to six months rather than three months. And I think it's likely, or certainly the, the, the commentary that's coming back, is that this extension would also benefit people bringing other harassment claims related to other characteristics such as age, disability, race, um, sex, and under the Equality Act. So it may well affect a wider group. Now, we don't have the draft legislation at the moment, but I do think this is something that we all need to have um, on the radar um, and be aware that it's coming our way. And what I wanted to do then is just talk a little bit about the practical implications for employers in terms of defending harassment claims. So some of you might remember in the last update, Kenny talked about the EAT case of LA UK against Galen, which is from November uh, last year, so just about a year ago. And it gave us some really helpful guidance about the nature and the quality of the arrangements that employers should have in place to try to succeed with a reasonable steps defence. So as a brief reminder, a tribunal is going to think about, first of all, what did the employer do? So did they have policies? Did they provide training? What resources were available? And then they'll also ask whether there were any other reasonable steps that could have been taken. And I think that's a really important factor for us to think about. The EHRC statutory code of practice on the Equality Act basically says an employer would be considered to have taken all reasonable steps if there were no further steps that they could have been expected to take. So I think that's quite a high bar for an employer to be able to show, to be able to use this defence. Now, in this particular case, um, 
you may recall, but very brief summary, that the claimant had been dismissed about a year into his employment on the grounds of his poor performance. He brought claims of direct race discrimination and harassment on the grounds of race. Now, his direct race discrimination claim failed, but he succeeded in his harassment claim and it reject the, the tribunal uh, rejected the employer's attempt to try and see it had taken reasonable steps to prevent the harassment. It had relied on the fact that it had an equal opportunities policy, it had an anti-bullying and anti-harassment policy, and it had provided training on those policies. But here's a red flag to you all. That training had taken place about two years before, and it had only included one slide about what could be considered to be harassment. In an appeal to the EAT, when the tribunal claim succeeded, the EAT um, didn't uphold the employer's appeal and it basically underlined the fact that what they'd done was not enough to rely on this defence. It basically said that the diversity training that had been provided two years before was stale. It said it would have been reasonable for the employer to provide refresher training and that the need for refresher training had been demonstrated and underlined by the fact that other employees who'd been aware of the alleged racial harassment had not reported it under the Equal Opportunities Policy, which said that they should. Now, they also said that brief and superficial training is unlikely to have a substantial effect and is unlikely to last long, but that thorough and forcefully presented training is more likely to be effective and to last longer. In this case also, an observation was made that the policies and training were not found to be particularly impressive, even though the respondent was a small employer. So I think this really underlines the need to have well-drafted and effective policies, um, regular and up-to-date training for everyone, and make sure people understand what they ought and ought not to be doing um, in terms of those policies monitor things and think about taking action if people cross the line. We really need to avoid a situation that uh, it's a tick box approach because the training and the policy implementation really needs to be effective. So just finally, I want to talk about one other case which has been um, in the EAT very recently and it's a case of Driscoll against VNP Global Limited. And this was a case um, which actually is not about sexual harassment, but it's about harassment related to other protected characteristics of sex, race um, and disability. And in this case, the claimant brought a claim against the company and also against the chief executive and founder of the company. So there were two respondents um, in, a, in what was a legal recruitment business. Now, the claimant said on various occasions the chief executive had made comments which constituted harassment and she'd resigned in response to that behaviour. Now, there was a bit of um, discussion about whether the shouting that was being complained about actually was related to the protected characteristics of sex, race or disability. But actually, the primary issue in this case was that um, it was whether the act of harassment could, in fact, be the reason for the constructive unfair dismissal. And the Employment Tribunal held that a constructive unfair dismissal could not be an amount of harassment. Um, it struck out her claim and it said that there was no reasonable prospect of success. Now, on appeal to the EAT, it reversed that position and it found that there was no difficulty in construing the harassment provisions in the Equality Act to encompass constructive unfair dismissal and that there was no limitation in there for what type of unwanted conduct would in fact constitute an act of harassment so long as it was related to a protected characteristic and had that purpose or effect that I talked about at the beginning. So that claim of harassment in the form of constructive unfair dismissal was reinstated by the EAT. The very last thing I just want to mention this morning in this field of harassment and, and sexual harassment claims is that there is also increasing pressure on the UK government to look at legislating against the use of non-disclosure agreements to silence uh, people who've been on the receiving end of sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, there is a lot of ongoing concern that clauses are being abused by employers and that they're disproportionate to the means um, 
it's worth bearing in mind though that it is not actually legally competent to prevent people from being a whistleblower and complaining about legal wrongdoing in these clauses. So I think this is a space that we're also going to be keeping an eye on because there are proposals for a bill to um, look at the, the use of or, or, or the prevention of the use of these types of gagging clauses of the become known in known disclosure agreements. Um, so that's a space that we're going to continue to watch with all of this and uh, give you an update as soon as we have a clearer picture for the timeline for it all coming in. So I'm now going to hand you over to Eleanor, who's going to uh, talk about menopause and the Equality Act. Eleanor. Thanks very much, Katie. Um, yes, so good morning everyone. Um, what I'm speaking about this morning is the menopause and it's actually quite timely, um, which we weren't aware when we were planning this uh, seminar, that uh, we're currently in the midst of Menopause Awareness Month. Um, and, you know, certainly this, it, I'm not aware that there have been um, these kinds of educational awareness uh, campaigns um, over the last few years, it's something that's gradually um, getting more and more light shed upon it. Um, the impact of menopause on women was rarely discussed in the media and is certainly something that wasn't regularly considered by employers. But now more and more people are feeling comfortable speaking out about the impact of the menopause upon them. Um, and so awareness is growing. And in particular, the focus has been, okay, so if you know, people are going through the menopause and there are all these symptoms, how is that going to impact upon them in the workplace? All menopause, or sorry, all women are going to experience menopause at some point during their life. And as well as that, it can also impact on trans persons and non-binary persons who don't identify as female. Most of those who experience the menopause will do so between the ages of 45 and 55. Some may experience symptoms earlier than others, and often those symptoms last between kind of four and eight years, but they can continue for longer. So when you think about it, it's a big chunk of your workforce's life. So as an employer, you know, how is this going to impact for your employees and, and what type of claims might an employee raise and what do you need to put into place to protect yourself from those claims? According to employment tribunal data, Claims have been brought by employees over the last few years, which are citing specifically the menopause within them. And these are increasing year on year. The majority of those claims are discrimination-based claims. But the menopause itself isn't a protected characteristic. And as such, claimants are attempting to raise their claims under disability, sex, or age discrimination, or sometimes a combination of the three. So we're going to look at a couple of those cases this morning. The first one is an employment tribunal claim of Merchant versus BT PLC. Um, and this was a claim for both unfair dismissal and sex discrimination. So uh, Mrs. Merchant brought her claim citing the menopause under sex discrimination. She um, had been dismissed for poor performance. And during the performance management process, she gave her manager a letter from her GP explaining that she was suffering from the menopause and it was affecting the level of concentration at the time. And so this was affecting her performance. Now, what normally happens and what this employer normally does um, when they would be performance managing someone and they are given medical information about, you know, why perhaps their performance is um, suffering, they would then refer that person to occupational health and get some more medical information that would then inform how they would continue to performance manage that person. In this particular instance, um, the employer didn't do that. And so the tribunal needed to consider, well, why did the employer not take that step? Why did the manager not seek additional medical information? Um, and the manager's explanation was that um, his wife had gone through the menopause and a work colleague had gone through the menopause and hadn't been affected in the same way that the claimant was affected. And as a result, he decided it wasn't necessary to seek um, occupational health view. Now, the tribunal found that the employer would not have adopted that approach with a non-female related condition or with a hypothetical male comparator. They held that the claimant had suffered direct 
sex discrimination and as a result her dismissal was unfair. By relying on his personal knowledge of his wife's and his colleagues menopause rather than on medical advice the manager had never been in a position uh, to reasonably conclude that the employee's performance warranted dismissal. So the next cases that I'm going to discuss are disability discrimination. So whereas Merchant looked at sex discrimination, um, these attempted to consider whether the menopause would be a disability. So the Birmingham Employment Tribunal last year in the case of Donaghy versus Talent Technology Services Limited, they did find that the menopausal symptoms that the claimant was suffering amounted to uh, a disability. And those uh, symptoms included 12 hot flushes a day and being woken in or around eight times every night by sweats as a result. And so for that uh, claimant, uh, she was able to proceed with her case on the basis that she was a disabled person due to her menopausal symptoms. Now, even though claims are increasing year on year, we don't actually have um, a lot of EAT judgments on the menopause. The majority and the ones that I've cited so far are tribunal cases, and so they are persuasive rather than binding. But what has been helpful is that the EAT has considered a claim of disability uh, discrimination on the grounds of the menopause in the last couple of weeks. And that case is Rooney versus Leicester City Council. So Mrs. Rooney brought quite a wide ranging claim. So she claimed disability and sex discrimination, harassment and victimization before the employment tribunal. But the EAT was uh, considering whether her menopausal symptoms and the fact that she had the menopause was a disability. The employment tribunal had found that it wasn't a disability and had struck out the, that, those parts of her claim. And this was despite the fact that she outlined in evidence um, at a preliminary hearing on her disability status that she suffered from physical, mental and psychological of effects of the menopause and had been doing so for about two years. And the effects were quite extensive. So they included insomnia, which caused fatigue and tiredness. She had lightheadedness, confusion, stress, depression, anxiety, palpitations, memory loss, migraines, and hot flushes. She had been prescribed hormone replacement treatment by her GP and was under the care of a consultant at a specialist uh, menopause clinic. As part of her claim, she stated that she felt embarrassed and uncomfortable discussing her menopausal symptoms with male managers. And this included at an internal appeal against a warning for absence where four men were present. She also advised that when she told her male manager that she was suffering from hot flushes in the office and that this was creating difficulty for her, he said, you know, I find the office very hot too. And he dismissed this as a menopause symptom. The EAT considered all of the evidence that um, Mrs. Rooney had given at the employment tribunal and found that the tribunal had erred in law by failing to um, find that she was a disabled person. They felt that there was sufficient evidence um, and that the tribunal's decision didn't properly explain why this evidence did not result in a finding of disability discrimination. They noted that they failed to take into account the detailed evidence provided by the claimant, um, both in terms of how um, the, the menopausal symptoms themselves and how it affected her day-to-day -day activities. And as a result, the case has been remitted back to the tribunal, a fresh tribunal, to reconsider the question of disability. And given the extensive evidence, it is likely that a fresh tribunal will find that the uh, claimant in that case is a disabled person. And this case really encapsulates the difficulties both for employers and employees when considering the menopause. And I guess it, it really is because, you know, menopause is a stage in life. It's not a medical condition. It's not a disability. If it happens to all women, to trans and non-binary persons, then is it correct that we should say that in terms of the Equality Act, they're, they're also disabled? Potentially not. And this leads on to the Women and Equalities Committee inquiry, which um, 
took place over the course of the summer and finished just there in September. So on the 23rd of July 2021, the House of Commons Women and Equalities Committee launched an inquiry into the existing discrimination legislation and the workplace practices around the menopause. And it hoped to examine the existing discrimination legislation to consider whether there is enough there to protect women, both in terms of leaving their jobs as a result of menopausal symptoms or suffering other negative consequences in the workplace. It is also hoped that by considering the discrimination legislation, uh, which is available, it will allow employers to further understand where their obligations are, what they are required to do in terms of their menopausal workforce. And according to the chair of that committee, uh, the Right Honourable Caroline Noakes, um, her quote uh, is there on the slide for you to see. Um, her view was menopausal women do not feel that they have adequate legal protection due to the lack of clarity in the legislation and the fact that the menopause doesn't fit neatly into the confines of the Equality Act. Um, so having to kind of shoehorn in a disability claim or find a proper comparator for a direct sex discrimination claim means that you're, you know, from an employee perspective, that claim may fail. And the figure that we have here of three of every five women suffering from a negative effect is certainly something that is being closely considered by uh, the Women and Equalities Committee. So that inquiry closed on the 17th of September and we expect further updates in due course. One of the primary um, positions from the committee is considering whether the menopause should be recognized itself as a, a separate protected characteristic. And if that were to happen, that would be quite a change to the Equality Act. Um, so we're essentially watching this space to see how um, the Women and Equalities Committee are considering all of the evidence that they have received and whether they'll be putting forward or suggesting legislation to amend the Equality Act and bring in the menopause as its own protected characteristic. So we might not be at that stage yet of a, a, a specific protected characteristic, but obviously we are looking at claims arising year on year. So the claims that I've looked at already are direct discrimination claims or unfair dismissal, and they tend to be the majority that have been brought so far. So where dismissal results from an absence or maybe a performance uh, management process where the claimant is saying, well, actually it was menopausal symptoms or the fact that I have the menopause that resulted both in my lengthy absences and the impact on my performance. So as well as direct sex, and disability claims, we might also have indirect claims. So indirect discrimination is where you've got a provision criterion, or, sorry, a policy criterion or practice, which appears to apply to all employees, but it put, puts those with a protected characteristic at a particular disadvantage when compared to those who don't have that protected characteristic. So the example here might be a uniform policy. So for those with the menopause who might be suffering from hot flushes and want to have, you know, cooling clothes or clothes that might hide sweat patches, which result from those flushes, a uniform policy, a dress code policy might impact on those, might place them at a particular disadvantage. Harassment claims as well. Katie's already gone through the definition of harassment and how that arises. And you could see how, you know, offensive comments uh, relating to the menopause might come under this um, if the claimant is able to establish that the menopause is a protected characteristic. Victimization is a claim that we don't see very often, and that's because it requires the claimant to have made a protected act. So for example, if they raise a, graven, a grievance um, about the treatment of their menopausal symptoms and they suffer a detriment as a result of that, then they potentially have a claim for victimization. And then the failure to make reasonable adjustments. Now this only arises in relation to disabled employees. But we have included it here because claims for the menopause are being brought under disability discrimination legislation. And so you might need to consider whether there is a failure to make reasonable adjustments or whether there is a duty to make reasonable adjustments on the employer. So, you know, the, the types of adjustments that might arise, which we've included here, flexible working, access to fans, access to better ventilation, those kinds of ideas. 
All of these claims are incredibly time consuming. They're expensive to defend. They're also damaging to the employer's reputation. And if the employee is still working with the employer, then you know it's damaging the ongoing employment relationship as well. So what is it then that employers can do? What should employers do? It's accepted there's a lack of clarity from the Equality Act. We do have other areas of law that can inform employers. And we also need to think about you know, best practice and reasonableness um, in terms of employers' actions and how that might be viewed. So there is a duty on employers to protect the health and we well-being of their workforce, for example. And we also have, um, you know, there's a requirement on employers not to behave in a way which might undermine the implied duty of trust and confidence that exists in the employment relationship. So those kind of things are, are already there without having a specific uh, area of the Equality Act to, to consider as well. So the first thing that we would consider is providing training for the workforce and in particular for management about the menopause, about the symptoms, how it might impact on people. Training managers on the interplay between those symptoms, the performance and absence management processes and discussing that topic at management meetings means that if an employee comes and, and, and says to a manager, like in that Rooney case, you know, the office is so hot, I'm having all these hot flushes, I'm finding it difficult to manage, then hopefully the manager won't just dismiss that and go, yeah, well, I find it hot as well, you know, there's nothing special there. So hopefully by engaging with management and getting it on their radar, it means that as they begin to manage their employees, it is, um, they're more aware of it. Uh, we also suggest that ensuring an, a fair sickness absence policy, which accommodates those uh, experiencing the menopause, perimenopause and menopausal symptoms should also be put into place expressly mentioning menopause in diversity and equality training sessions is also a good idea not only because it, it keeps it as the live issue in terms of you know management oversight but for employees as well having an informal support at work for those experiencing menopause or perimenopausal symptoms so workplace networks an online support group helpline numbers you know a group that um, employees can discuss together you know how how it's impacting on them can really make a world of difference so too can the introduction of a menopause policy which signals the supports that are available uh, from the employer and considering any suggestions to improve the working environment from those employees rather than dismissing them out of hand. So not necessarily taking them as reasonable adjustments, but you know, looking at um, what suggestions are being made and how it might help. So things might include access to fans, the ability to control the temperature, even having clean and comfortable toilet facilities near workstations with appropriate sanitary disposal bins, having hygiene products available, having showers available, all of those kinds of things um, are things that can be very easily changed or introduced um, and will make uh, a real difference because not only will taking these reasonable measures mitigate hopefully against the legal claims, but it's that support uh, that you're showing to employees so hopefully that those claims won't arise in the first place. So on that note, I'm going to hand you over to Kenny, who's going to be talking a little bit more about disability discrimination this morning. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Eleanor. Um, morning, everyone. So in this fourth and final section this morning, we're looking at disability discrimination. And we're going to take this uh, final section in two parts. So part one is going to be looking at long COVID and part two is looking at a couple of recent disability discrimination cases. Um, so long COVID, um, what is long COVID? Well, on one level, the answer to that is we don't really know. Um, the answer is emerging and we're learning more all of the time. Um, but that answer would make for quite a short presentation. So um, what do we know? Well, NHS guidance states that many people with COVID-19 will be better within a few days or weeks, and most make a full recovery within 12 weeks. However, as we all know, in some cases, symptoms can last significantly longer than that. 
and it's those that are still suffering with the effects of COVID-19 after 12 weeks that are considered um, by the NHS to have long COVID. So, so that's in their guidance, that's not a legal definition. Um, the NHS has also defined long COVID as a multi-system condition with a wide span of symptoms. So that includes fatigue, breathlessness, cough, chest pain, heart palpitations, fever, headache, muscle pain, loss of taste and smell. Um, and alongside these physical type symptoms, uh, the NHS recognises several psychological symptoms. So for example, depression, anxiety, PTSD, and brain fog or some level of cognitive impairment. Certainly this is a very topical issue and the statistics certainly bear out that this is likely to be an issue around for some time. Um, the latest Office for National Statistics figures for Scotland um, estimate that 79,000 people in Scotland are living with self-reported, so not clinically diagnosed, but self-reported long COVID. And that's up 5,000 from the previous month's figures. 61,000 people have experienced long COVID symptoms for more than 12 weeks, and 31,000 people for more than a year, which as we'll come on to is very crucial for the definition of a legal disability. Some of you may be aware that the University of Glasgow are leading a major study into long COVID, um, something to keep an eye on, and they're asking people with a positive test the same set of questions at set intervals, so after 12, 18 and 24 months from the date that they first tested positive. And from that, they're trying to build a kind of evidence bank um, of data to analyse and, and learn more about long COVID and, and how we can manage it. Um, so certainly these statistics just bear out the scale, the scale of the issue and, and clearly this is going to feed into workplace issues as well. So does long COVID qualify as a, a legal disability under the Equality Act? Well, let's have a quick recap of the definition which is up there on the slide. So a person has a disability if they have a physical or mental impairment and the impairment has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on the person's ability to carry out their normal day-to-day -day activities. Now, long-term means that the substantial adverse impact has lasted for 12 months or is likely to last for 12 months or the rest of the person's life. Um, and to qualify as substantial, it's a very low hurdle. It, the effects must only be more than minor or trivial, so, so a very low bar. Um, some other key points just to pull out here in terms of the definition and how that fits in with long COVID. Um, there, there's no need for a formal medical diagnosis or indeed for the precise nature of an impairment to be determined. Um, in effect, its existence can be uh, deduced um, from, from the effect that it has. And I think that's very important um, when we're thinking about long COVID because it won't always be clinically diagnosed. When I talked about likely in terms of something likely to last 12 months, likely simply means in this context that it could well happen. So again, a very low bar if we're thinking about whether the effects of long COVID um, could last for, for 12 months. Um, and also bear in mind that if the effects of someone's long COVID come and go, um, that under the definition of disability, if that substantial adverse effect is likely to recur, it's treated as continuing to have that effect. So even though there might be a pattern of they get a bit better and then lapse backwards, um, if the effects of long COVID are likely to recur, then it's treated as continuing throughout that period and therefore could well um, last for 12 months or be seen as likely to last for 12 months. Um, so bottom line, basically, um, it's quite likely that someone genuinely struggling with long COVID um, could well meet the test of legal disability, um, but you're going to have to get medical evidence. And as we always say, each case will turn on its own uh, specific facts. You may have seen that the TUC has called for uh, long COVID to be deemed a disability. That's not happened yet, and we've not seen anything to indicate that it's going to be acted on by the government. <laughs> 
one further set of statistics just to set the context and, the, and this is some research specifically in the workplace by the TUC um, earlier this summer. So they surveyed more than three and a half thousand workers on their experiences of long COVID um, and the survey revealed that of those surveyed 29% had experienced symptoms lasting longer than 12 months um, so quite a high proportion. 72% experienced brain fog and 62% had difficulty concentrating. Um, so again, these statistics suggest that the test for disability will be satisfied in many instances of long COVID. Um, and while more physical based symptoms such as extreme fatigue, um, coughing, etc., may prevent an employee from returning to work altogether, of course, we need to bear in mind the more psychological based symptoms such as brain fog, difficulty concentrating, um, which can also have a, a major impact, of course. And we definitely anticipate seeing these sorts of issues playing out in disability discrimination claims uh, over the coming months and years. Um, we'll certainly report on those as and when they happen. We're, we're seeing uh, multi-day discrimination cases listed into 2023 now. Um, so these issues do take some time to work their way through into reported um, tribunal decisions. But what sort of claims do we need to be alive to? Um, well, section 15 claims in terms of someone with long COVID being treated unfavorably because of something arising in connection with their disability. Uh, that's subject, as you'll be aware, to a justification defence. Um, failure to make reasonable adjustments, a huge area around um, how do we approach reasonable adjustments for someone with long COVID when, when we still know so little about it. Possibly also indirect discrimination claims around certain hybrid working policies or other workplace practices um, which impact more on individuals with long COVID. Um, you might be asking or already have grappled with the issue of well how are we expected to know if someone has um, long COVID um, even if they're self-reporting it you know how, how, how do we actually establish that and that is a very relevant point and in many cases the lack of that knowledge will be a defence to certain claims um, but we suggest it's better to be proactive um, if there if there is a suggestion of long COVID and get appropriate medical input so you can make an informed decision um, and certainly when you are making that referral to the you know GP specialist occupational health um, is very much worth taking the time to do a tailored referral um, and ask um, very specific questions which will produce um, better and more precise answers that will help you um, make the particular workplace decision that you're that you're having to make. Um, in terms of other particular um, kind of tips for, for employers, um, getting appropriate medical input is absolutely key. Um, and given medical knowledge of long COVID is changing all the time and also people's um, symptoms and um, the effect of long COVID on people is changing all the time, you need to make sure that um, evidence is from an appropriate individual and is up to date when you are making substantive decisions um, about that about that individual. Um, you must also ensure of course that members of staff are not treated unfavourably because of something arising in connection with long COVID, that's the section 15 type claim um, that I mentioned. Um, if you think there is a link back to long COVID, um, then think about whether the unfavourable treatment can be avoided. If it can't, you know, if there does need to be, you know, a disciplinary issue or a performance issue progressed or an absence issue, um, think about whether you have an objective justification to defend that claim, um, and try try if you can to document that at the time. Uh, that will certainly put you in a better position to defend claims down the line. I mentioned the management of absence. Another thing to be thinking about is if you have absence trigger points under your policy um, and someone's absence is um, because of long COVID and we think in that particular case it may be a disability, we need to think about reasonable adjustments to those um, trigger points when managing uh, that absence. Um, 
I mentioned reasonable adjustments. Um, what is reasonable in any particular case will depend on the circumstances. The reasonable adjustment does need to be um, effective. And looking at reasonable adjustments is not just a one-off um, task. It's something that is a continuing ongoing duty. Um, so you, need, you may need to revisit what is a reasonable adjustment for each particular employee um, at you know, periodic intervals um, whilst dealing with a long COVID type situation. Um, we've put up on this slide there some um, further tips for employers um, pulled over from some ACAS guidance, um, which you may want to go and have, have a look at if you're interested. Um, I'll just pick out a couple of these. So the very first one I think is, is, is a very good bit of advice, which is to agree with the employee um, if they're off with long COVID or suffering with long COVID, how and when to make contact during any absence. That is a particular issue that often comes up and plays out in grievances and also um, down the line in claims. So clearly the employee can't just say, go away, don't contact me at all. Um, but if you can agree a, a time of contact, a means of contact, whether that's a text followed by a call or whatever it is, um, that can certainly help. Um, and also just to highlight the final bullet point on that slide, what the employee wants you to tell others, if anything, um, about their absence um, and what's communicated to their team or their direct reports, etc., when they come back. Um, we need to think of data protection considerations and also privacy considerations. So that's another very important point um, to bear in mind. I would also suggest that, um, as well as the things you'll all be very familiar about, you know, reasonable adjustments, OH, phased returns, etc., um, thinking about training for your managers and upskilling your managers. They're the ones on the front line, if you like, who often have the first interaction with their team and they need to be aware when they're potentially dealing with a long COVID situation and what the implications of that are um, before they set in motion, for example, performance management, absence management, without perhaps realising the wider context, which, um, you know, certainly in HR, um, you'll be more aware of, but, but, but line managers need to have, have that training um, and upskilling wherever possible. So that's really only scratched the surface of long COVID, um, but hopefully that's helpful as a starting point. Um, we're going to move on to the second part of this section, which is to look at a couple of recent disability discrimination cases. Um, so the first case there on the slide is the case of Seacom against REIT. Um, this is a really helpful decision about the issue of knowledge of disability and when an employer can be said to have actual knowledge or constructive knowledge of a disability. So at the end of this case, um, just to give you the end point to keep in mind, the employee was found not to be disabled. But of more interest for our purposes, I think, um, is that even if there had been a disability, the employer was found not to have actual or constructive knowledge um, of any such alleged disability. So very briefly on the background facts here, um, the, the claimant the employee was relying on anxiety and depression as amounting to legal disability. They were eventually summarily dismissed on performance grounds um, from their role, um, just about a year and a half into employment. Um, the claimant had actually worked with one of the managers in his previous employment with a separate employer. Um, and that manager um, from the previous job and in the, in the current respondents organisation had no knowledge of the anxiety or depression. It was also very relevant in the tribunal's eyes that the claimant had completed an equal ops questionnaire at the start of employment and when asked if there were any health related issues or impairments he had just he had just said no. Um, so there was no evidence um, at all on the employer's part of, of the kind of mental health condition and anxiety and, and depression that was later relied on. Indeed, when the, the, the claimant was being performance managed, um, he mentioned, I think in a meeting, his disgust at being performance managed, but didn't say performance issues arose from any mental health condition. There was a, a later breakdown where the individual said, I'm bordering on a breakdown, I'm barely able to talk about things, but having been signed off uh, work, he then came back to work 
and the employer was entitled to rely on that fit note saying he was fit to come back to work um, and didn't have actual or constructive knowledge um, of, um, of that alleged disability. So just to move on to our final case, this is the case of Aleem. Um, this concerned a, a teacher who was no longer able to carry out their substantive science teaching role. They moved over to a cover supervisor role. Um, their pay was protected for a probationary period and during a grievance um, procedure around this. But ultimately, they were moved on to lower rate of pay attached to that role. The, the teacher claimed that it would have been a reasonable adjustment to maintain her teacher salary. Um, being a disabled individual, she said that that was a reasonable adjustment. The employer refused and they were justified to refuse. And the, the guidance from the tribunal is what we'd expect it to be in this situation, which is it would be a very rare case in which the maintenance of previous rates of pay would be a, a reasonable adjustment in the longer term once someone moves moves over to a substantive uh, new post. Um, so that's all I wanted to say for that um, section. So I'll hand you back now to Katie. Thanks very much, Kenny. Um, some really interesting um, real nuggets of helpful information in, in those cases, I think, actually. Um, in this new, I suppose, newish era of us dealing with long COVID. So we're now uh, going to move on to the Q&A section of our uh, webinar this morning. And we've got a few questions that have come in. So I'm just going to work through them just in as far as time allows this morning. So the first question is for Megan. Um, this is something that I'm sure many people have um, had in their minds when listening to you this morning. How can employers manage a situation where they've got employees with very definite views, for example, on gender or on sex, and they, 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 co you know, they, they clash, they co there's an issue between the, the views of different employees? What would you suggest in practical terms about ways to manage that? I think it's important to differentiate, um, as was done in the case law, the existence of these views and how they then manifest themselves. So again, the, the issue that um, some employers may find from this is that employers who have decisive views, it's not necessarily the fact that they hold the views themselves that poses the problem, it's how they actually manifest these in dealing with other people, communicating online, or um, in communicating with other employees. So I think it's the case law is quite clear in that employers aren't prevented from managing someone because of the effect of these views. So if someone is saying things that are inappropriate, if they are doing something that may be actually harassing someone else or discriminating against someone else or posting things online that are completely inappropriate, you can still manage these people by through the normal disciplinary process. It's just important to focus on the effect rather than we are disciplining you because you hold these views, because obviously that's not the issue, it's the effect of these. So it's kind of being careful and, and really just making sure that you go through the disciplinary process and focus exactly on what the impact is rather than the fact that they hold these views in the first place. But again, it's not a simple issue, I think. <laughs> no, I, th I think so. And you can see why in that situation, the, the, the drafting of letters and, and what Ever documentation correspondence is relied on for those processes is going to be really important that it points yeah. in the right direction. <laughs> good, good. Okay, next question is one for Eleanor. Um, it, whether, as a matter of practice, we should be treating all employees who um, are affected by menopause as if they have a disability within the meaning of the Act? I can I can see why you know that might seem a, a simple solution, but I guess I mean the the first thing is that they might not be disabled, so they might not be entitled to, for example, reasonable adjustment. Um, and I think I think you can treat people fairly and reasonably, but if you are going to say yes, we accept you have a disability, we accept we have a duty to make reasonable adjustments, you want to be very clear and confident that that is the case. So instead, 
I think focusing it um, differently by, you know, those, those tips about, you know, how you support them and, and how you ensure that the management are aware that this is something you will need to take into account. And if it comes up through absence, through performance, even through discipline, uh, those processes that you get more information from the employee, you get occupational help before you go straight in and say, yeah, absolutely, you will, you have a disability under the Equality Act. These are all the duties that you know we are uh, required to comply with. Um, because it, it might well be that they don't fulfill that test. And until you know, if the menopause does become a protected characteristic, it's still for the claimant to show, you know, is it sex discrimination? Is it a disability? There are there are tests there in terms of that, in terms of direct discrimination, have they the correct comparator, all of that. So you don't necessarily want to be accepting something, especially at the start of a process when you don't have all of the information that gives you an informed position. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, now, just looking through um, a question for Kenny, uh, how do we go about considering reasonable adjustments for long COVID when this is still a pretty unknown condition? Um, yeah, very good question. Um, and it's, it's going to be quite difficult. Um, I think keep in mind that what is reasonable depends on your organisation, so your resources, um, costs, the impact of the change. Also bear in mind that for an adjustment to be reasonable, it has to be effective um, in dealing with the specific disadvantage. Um, so an individual may want a particular change, a particular adjustment, but that needs to be backed up ideally by medical evidence to show that it would be effective in, in dealing with the issue. So um, let's take brain brain fog in terms of long COVID as, as an example. I guess in some situations um, that cognitive impairment, if you like, could mean an individual struggles with particular tasks. So it might be a reasonable adjustment to, to move those tasks over or give them extra support, checking whatever it is with those tasks. Another individual with brain fog or some kind of cognitive impairment around long COVID, the medical evidence might be that they're going to struggle with that, whatever the tasks in their role, whether they work from home, whether they work in the office, whether it's reduced hours or not. So any of those kinds of changes, whilst the individual might want them, they're not going to be effective in dealing with their specific disadvantage. So it wouldn't be a reasonable adjustment, but uh, gosh, it's, it's going to be tricky and we'll just have to get medical evidence and deal with each each case as it crops up. Yeah, I think that's really that's really good advice and it's just not a one size fits all, is it? And I suppose with, with both of these situations with uh, long COVID and also when you think about menopause and reasonable adjustments as well, if it's a disability, then a very similar sort of approach to looking at each case on its own facts is going to really be important. Um, question, I think, which is probably for me actually, is um, whether segregating male and female colleagues in a workplace could be considered as a reasonable step to prevent sexual harassment. Uh, that's a very interesting approach. Um, it, it kind of assumes a bit of a binary route that if you know that 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 women won't harass women or men won't harass men and. It, it doesn't really deal with the question of, I suppose, people who are trans, who've gone through gender reassignment processes. So while you might think of that, I'm not sure it's going to go far enough. And actually, is it really going to have the effect that you want it to have? Because physical distancing is not just going to be the, the one thing that's going to prevent harassment. I mean, a lot of what we see these days is harassment that's carried out by electronic means, by emails, by communication. Um, the other thing to bear in mind, I think, is that the um, Code of Practice, the HRC's Code of Practice about employers and the Equality Act says um, that an employer would be considered to have taken all reasonable steps if there were no further steps that they could be expected to take. I think if you remember I said that this morning and that's quite a that's quite a big step. Um, this code needs to be taken into account by tribunals in considering claims and it, the, the code says reasonable steps might include implementing an equality policy as we've discussed, ensuring people are aware of the policy, providing 
training on that, reviewing it, keeping it up to date and dealing effectively with complaints. And I think those really need to be your starting point in looking at building a, a basis for a defence to um, to a, to a harassment claim, taking reasonable steps, and I, I think there is a you know there's a slight difference um, also just to acknowledge between sexual harassment, which is the harassment I described on on the basis of um, unwanted sexual conduct or or related to sex or gender reassignment, um, which needs to be about um, unfavourable treatment of the person rejecting or submitting to the behaviour, but equally this defence is appropriate to people who complain of harassment related to sex or age or disability or race um, in the more broad sense, and um, that can be brought by a much wider scope of people. Um, it doesn't need to be somebody who's um, rejected or submitted to behaviour. So um, I think the starting point is go with the policies and, and training and, and make sure that you, you have a really, really clear messaging and education process for people, um, which will go much further than physical segregation, I would suggest. Um, I'm just looking to see if there are any more questions. I'm going to throw this open to our floor of speakers this morning. Um, is somebody who is now working at home considered to be at the workplace? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and let's be thankful we don't have an express duty to prevent harassment by third parties at the moment. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, all those uh, Ellen, deep uh, deliveries. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor, how about that one? Do you want to just briefly respond to that? I think it. Oh, I think it can be, um, because I guess if you think about it, if someone's at their home computer and they're receiving harassing emails, you know that's still going to come within that realm. As you mentioned, a lot of this isn't just people happen to be in an office in a workplace where this is happening and if we think of you know there have been quite a lot of claims where things are happening outside of the workplace but linked so office Christmas parties are always a nightmare you know those kind of office social events company social events they aren't necessarily happening in the workplace but you know the, the effects are still felt anyone else please feel free <laughs> No, I think that's I think that's really helpful. Um, and uh, this is just an area we're just going to have to watch and see how things develop as well. Lots of cases to come, I think. So that actually concludes all the questions for today. So I would like to thank everyone for um, joining us this morning. It's been a real pleasure to present this webinar to you and also to answer the questions. Hope you found our presentations very helpful. Now, we are going to, as I said, um, send around a recording of this uh, webinar this morning. And if you have any questions or feedback um, or if we can help at all, please do email us at employment live at mcroberts.com. We also, this is the uh, this is the pleading part, um, are going to send our survey around. So we'll be really grateful for your feedback in that because that helps us just keep things fresh and make sure that we're covering topics that you want to hear about. Um, so uh, we'll look forward to receiving that. And I suppose the final point is uh, don't forget to sign up. If you're not on our mailing list, do sign up because we do um, much more than these biannual seminars. We have regular podcasts and e-updates and blogs that come out with um, news as developments happen. So I hope that you find those very, very useful. So thanks again for joining us this morning and we hope to see you again very soon, perhaps in person rather than on screen. Thanks very much.